But I was reminded of what I had read in Scripture. And I was reminded of uh, Jesus uh, uh, looking at his disciples and saying, Oh, you of little faith, and how a mustard seed can move a mountain. And then I was reminded of the story that Jesus told. It wasn't a story. It was an actual event about this daddy that had his child. And, and the daddy wanted Jesus to heal his child. And, but the dad says, my faith is so weak. And then he prayed to Jesus and he said, Lord, um, you know, strengthen or increase my faith is the yeah. exact words yeah. he said. Increase yeah. my faith. And so when I was praying to God that night as to why my prayer hadn't been answered, you know what? The light bulb came on. I told God in my prayer, I said, I know it ain't you. You're perfect. Yeah. It's got to be something with me. What is it? And then I said, oh, I know what it is. I've been praying for this thing forever. And I've been putting it all on you, God. I haven't been doing my part by having faith. Mm and abundant faith that you would do it. Yeah. And in that prayer that night, I prayed to God. I said, God, I need your help. Increase my faith abundantly like you did for yeah. that father in the, in the story in the Bible when he was with Jesus. And you know what? From that moment on, never a problem again. It mm. was, I had to do my part. I had to I had to pray to get my faith increased because I've got this picture in my mind that I saw years ago, the way prayer and faith works. You got God is reaching his hand down. Yeah. But I got to reach my hand up in faith. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Oh my lands, have I got an amazing guest on today's Raising Private Money show. Well, welcome to Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority. And my guest today, a dear friend of mine, we're in mastermind groups together, together. He's raised hundreds of thousands of dollars in private money for his real estate deals. Now, he's a real estate investor. He's a creative financing consultant. He's a, an outsourcing and marketing expert. So in addition to all that, he's also an expert at flipping properties remotely. How in the world do you flip properties virtually and remotely? Well, we're going to dive down on that as well. Well, my guest and dear friend knows exactly what it feels like to be stuck, as in like you just can't get traction when it comes to your income or your lifestyle. Well, my guest and friend knows exactly what's that like. He was there just like you, and he knew there was another way. So his life completely changed, completely transformed when he discovered real estate investing and Lease options is big jam. His three keys to being successful in business is number one, marketing. Number two, automation. And number three, delegation. He's an avid family guy and nothing is more important to him than God and family. In just a moment, you're going to meet my dear friend and guest, Joe McCall, right after this. <laughs> Oh, my lands, welcome to the show, Joe McCall. What's up, Jay? Good to see you, man. Good to see you. Man, you are looking fantastic. I tell you what, I mean, you've lost this weight recently. I mean, you got the tan going on. <laughs> I mean, you are looking fantastic, Joe, and thank you so much for thank taking you. the time out to join me here on the show. Appreciate it, Jay. You know, having open heart surgery will help you lose a little weight. Yeah, well, I want to lose myself about 57 pounds, but I sure don't want to do it with the heart surgery thing. Mm -hmm. So since you brought up the heart surgery, we're going, to, we're going to dive here into real estate. We're going to dive into private money, how you get it, where you find the private money for your real estate deals. We're going to dive into your expertise on top of that, lease options, 
flipping properties remotely, all that kind of good stuff. But before we get into it, you just recently went through this heart surgery. What advice would you give to other people that you've learned from this experience? Yeah, great question. Because, you know, what does it matter if you understand how to raise private money, if you know how to do real estate deals, if you're sick and unhealthy and die? You know, I was 49 years old. Um, I had this congenital thing, which means it wasn't, I didn't have a heart attack. It didn't happen suddenly. But over time, for since I was born, I don't know, I've had a bad aortic valve and my valve was calcified. And I've been having palpitations and dizzy spells and kind of blew it off, thought maybe I'm not getting enough sleep, too much stress, too much caffeine. And um, so I finally told my wife about it. And um, she's like, we should, we were in uh, Texas on vacation. She said, we should at least call a doctor to make an appointment when we get back. So I said, fine, okay. I did. The, 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 the assistant, like the lady answering the phones, not even the nurses or the doctors, the lady answered their phone said, hey, um, you need to go to the urgent care emergency room like right now. Why are you even calling us? And so I said, all right. So we went to the urgent care. They said, your heart is really in really, really bad shape. I can't believe that you can actually stand and walk and you look healthy. This is really serious. You need to go to uh, the emergency room right now to have surgery. And they put IVs in my arms and I was just at the urgent care. And, um, but then the doctor there said, listen, if I can get you an appointment with my friend who's a cardiologist tomorrow morning, I won't send you to the urgent care right now. So we went and saw the, the cardiologist the next morning. He's like, yeah, uh, you need to go into surgery as soon as possible and replace your valve because it's really, really bad. Mm. And my, my, my blood is recirculating, regurgitating in my heart. It wasn't pumping in and out. So anyway, I'm 49, kind of, you know, a little freaked out a little bit, but, you know, I felt, all right, we'll just have to do this. We have to take, get it taken care of. Um, they did let me drive home. So we drove home over the next day or two, went into surgery a few days later. And uh, three days later, after the surgery, I'm walk, I walk, I mean, I walk out of there, go home. Um, four days after the surgery, I'm in church in a lot of pain on a lot of pain meds. But I'm feeling much better. Um, you know, it's, it's it, my chest hurts a lot. It's been six weeks. I had lost 30 pounds before the surgery. I've lost 10 pounds since. I've lost a total of 40 pounds. Mm. But um, it all happened so fast. And I heard somebody say at one of the masterminds we're a part of, Jay, he said, people who are healthy have thousands of wishes. And they want, I have all these goals. But somebody who's sick really only has one goal, right? And so I, I, I thought about that a lot since then. And that was one of the things that helped me um, get into better health and also helped me think about my business and think about how can, ways that I can re recreate recurring passive income so that if I am out of commission, my business can still run without me. Mm -hmm. So I've been through this process, really been thinking a lot about making sure everything is set up with my family. Everything's fine with them. I have wife, four kids who are between 12 and eight, 12 and 19 years old. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I've been thinking a lot about what do I want my business to look like? Can my business support my family? If I'm out of commission, if I die, whatever, I've got a lot of life insurance. But like, what if I can't work? What if I have a stroke? Or what if, you know, will I be able to provide income for my family? So that's that's crazy stuff. It's deep. It's scary. But like, you people need to start thinking about this kind of stuff, you know, Number one, is your health in, are you in good health? Like, are you going to the doctor? Are you doing what the doctor tells you to do? Mm -hmm. and, and are you getting your regular checkups and stuff like that? And number two is, is your business set up where it can run without you in spite of you, right? That's something that I think about a lot, whether it's my real estate business or my publishing business. Um, do I have the team and do I have the team in place? Do I have the people in place, the systems, the deals, the cash flow recurring that I can still make money? And I can say this, the two months that I was out of commission, um, my revenue went down a little bit, but my profit went up. So I was actually making more money net while I was removed from the business. Now, I don't know how long that could have lasted, but 
it, it felt really good. I, you know, yeah, I so, so it, what, what do you think is the reason for that? How did that happen? Or is that just, things. you know, coincidental? A couple of things. Number one is recurring revenue, recurring passive income from real estate deals and from like I have other businesses where I sell, for example, I sell Freedom Soft because I use it every day and I sell Freedom Soft. It's a software to help manage your real estate leads. Mm-hmm. So I get recurring revenue from that. Um, that's number one is recurring revenue, passive income. We also do a lot. I sell a lot of I have a lot of notes for our real estate deals where I'm collecting money every month from that. Mm -hmm. Um, But the second thing is getting a team, getting people to work with you and for you. So I've got um, in my businesses, I have three or four, uh, three full-time employees in the United States and maybe four virtual assistants, full-time virtual assistants in the Philippines. Um, So I've got a team of seven people about, and um, they keep everything going. And Mm -hmm. I do have one I've t- they're all really, really good. But I have one lady who kind of manages the, the entire team. She's like my operations manager. Mm-hmm. And so that's something that's really important. Like I don't have the bandwidth. I don't have the energy. I don't have the leadership skills to manage an entire team. So I hired somebody that could do that for me. Mm-hmm. And that's been huge because when I was in the hospital, you know, she's like, Joe, don't worry about a thing. I don't want to hear from you. I don't want to see you. I don't want to talk to you for at least a month mm-hmm. and leave us alone and we'll take care of everything. And like, <laughs> that was huge. And then third and fourth, I got two more. Number three, uh, have an amazing spouse, uh, a, a wife, a husband, spouse that can just help take care of you. My wife has been a bedrock, um, just amazing, mm-hmm. supporting me through all this. And then the fourth thing, finally, is my faith in God. You know, and the, and the church we go to, the people from church have been so supportive, like just going incredibly overboard in supporting me and my family and helping us through this thing. Um, just the, the, the flower. I mean, when you go into my hotel room and it looked like a florist shop, you know, you, mm. we got tons of people that sent us gifts and cards and food for us to eat. You know, or we had so much food. We were like, please don't send us any food. Let's just schedule a time we can go out to dinner. <laughs> um, but like, so we together, like with them, right? So right. we've had so much support from family and friends and, and, and people from church. Like I'm telling you this, I don't, this isn't a religious show, but I'm telling you, if, if you don't have any friends or if you don't belong to a good church or a synagogue, you know, something like you got to get connected to other people. Because when the, when you need help, when you need support, like there is, in my opinion, nothing better from a community standpoint to be in plugged into a community and a network of friends, local, like in your neighborhood that can help you and support you. And then also you can help and support other people when they need help and stuff like that. So like help, all of that just helped me get through this. My recovery has been really, really good. Um, I'm still taking Advil and Tylenol for my chest pains and stuff, but it's like um, my, I think I, I've had a really, really good recovery. I'm feeling better and stronger than I have in a long, long time. Well, Joe, what you just shared, first of all, a comment on one of the last things you said, you know, God did not create us to live on an island by yes. ourselves <laughs> for sure. And, and by the way, you said this isn't a religious show. Well, I will tell you, uh, all the listeners are believers <laughs> or they wouldn't be here because yeah. they hear me talk about my faith all the time. I tell you, Joe, uh, your testimony and your story that you just shared about your recent experience, um, I would encourage you to let that be your hot seat at our next mastermind. <laughs> mm, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> just let, I mean, hey, look, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask my producer, Scott Patton of my, of the podcast here to just, send you a link to this show and you just listen and and have your assistant make notes on the first 11 minutes of this show. That's your hot seat at the next mastermind. (laughs) That's good. You know, Matt has asked me to speak at the next family mastermind. Yeah. Well, uh, well, there's your talk. There's your talk. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Joe, thank you for taking your filter off for my audience and just sharing the stuff that's just like really, really important. I mean, you know, People that are entrepreneurs, we're driven, 
you know, to succeed, to achieve. And it's just like, you know, more, 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 you know, just, you know, sometimes not you, not you, you already knew what was important. Thank God. Um, but you know, for our listeners, you don't want to be one of those people that you're just going more, 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 more. And one day, you know, something happens in your life and you are, you're forced to ask yourself the question, why, why, why am I doing more, more, right. more? Joe, you probably haven't heard me share this story, but a good friend of mine who happens to be an elder in our church, um, not too long ago, we were riding down the road. His name is Neil. In fact, Neil may be listening to this show. I don't know. But anyway, we're riding down the road and, and Neil says, Jay, I got a question for you. I said, okay, what's that? He says, um, when is enough enough? Mm. And I said, well, I think I know what you're asking, but tell me what you mean by the question. He says, well, you just, you know, you just work all the time. And, and by the way, I don't work all the time. What I do is what I do is what I do is what I do. But anyway, he says, you work all the time and you know, you're just busy, 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 but you know, you're flying all over the country, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He says, how do you reconcile the uh, scripture where the apostle Paul says to be content in whatever state you're in? I said, oh, now I understand the question. Now I can give you the answer. Enough is never enough when it's not about you. Mm. Enough is never enough when it's not about you. So anyway, again, Joe, thank you for so much for taking your filter off. Well, let's dive into the business stuff since we got the important stuff out of the way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's really good, man. For me, I can't separate the two, right? Like I couldn't be where I am without God. Like. And I'm not ashamed to say that the I, I've made so many stupid mistakes, Jay, that uh, and I've gotten myself into tons of trouble before. And but welcome, he got to the me club. Out of it. welcome to the club. I'm 62. Yes. <laughs> you know, I, I did a I did a little video today. Like, thank God for that verse in Lamentations. It says, yet this will I no, um It says, I, yet I still dare to hope. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never fail. They are new every morning. Yes. Great is his faithfulness. Yes. Right. And so like, even in spite of all the mistakes, I, you know, if you look at a balance of how many mistakes and how many successes I've had, I've made way more mistakes than successes, but thank God he's helped me get through that and is for, you know, forgiven me and all of that. So when I talk about my success in business, it, it's not because I'm so smart and good looking and I wear cool clothes or I, you know, what I look, <laughs> it's not any of that, man. It's because I've made so many mistakes and I've learned from my failures and uh, God has picked me up over and over again and said, all right, that's all right. You learned your lesson. Now, next time do it this way instead of your way. Why, why not you, what, listen to me and stop trying to figure it out on your own, you know, ask me for wisdom and I'll give it to you. Just ask me for it. That's my story. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, you said something a second ago about your faith. Um, I've heard. Uh, thank you, Chris. Chris just chimed in and said, great podcast. Tony just chimed in and said, awesome. So you said something about your faith a second ago. And for all of our listeners here on the show and the podcast, I promise you, hang in there. We're getting to the private money. We're getting into lease options and all that here in a second. But. We're just, this is just a fantastic, important conversation. Faith. So um, I prayed to God for a long time for help in a particular era, era, uh, part of my life that it doesn't matter what it is. But anyway, here's the point. I prayed for help for years and, and nothing happened. And so time went by. And so I remember one night, uh, Joe, I was praying to God. I said, God, I've said, I've, I've prayed for help. I've prayed for help. I've prayed for help. And it's like, you know, this hasn't gotten any better. Yeah. I said, what's wrong? I know your promises are perfect. You always fulfill your promises. And I said, what's going on? Why is this? How can this be? And God gave me the answer, not directly. God didn't whisper in my ear, but I was reminded of what I had read in scripture. And I was reminded of 
uh, Jesus uh, uh, looking at his disciples and saying, Oh, you of little faith, and how a mustard seed can move a mountain. And then I was reminded of the story that Jesus told. It wasn't a story. It was an actual event about this daddy that had his child. And, and the daddy wanted Jesus to heal his child. And, but the dad says, my faith is so weak. And then he prayed to Jesus and he said, Lord, um, you know, strengthen or increase my faith is the yeah. exact words yeah. he said. Increase yeah. my faith. And so when I was praying to God that night as to why my prayer hadn't been answered, you know what, Joe, the light bulb came on. I told God in my prayer, I said, I know it ain't you. You're perfect. Yeah. It's got to be something with me. What is it? And then I said, oh, I know what it is. I've been praying for this thing forever. And I've been putting it all on you, God. I haven't been doing my part by having faith. Mm and abundant faith that you would do it. Yeah. And in that prayer that night, I prayed to God. I said, God, I need your help. Increase my faith abundantly like you did for yeah. that father in the, in the story in the Bible when he was with Jesus. And you know what? From that moment on, never a problem again. It mm. was, I had to do my part. I had to I had to pray to get my faith increased because I've got this picture in my mind that I saw years ago, the way prayer and faith works. You got God is reaching his hand down. Yeah. But I got to reach my hand up in faith. Right. Yeah. So, well, how in the world did we get off on all that? I guess it's because it's good stuff, believe. man. <laughs> it, nothing else really matters. Yeah. Nothing else really matters. You can't take it home. You can't take it to heaven with you. Right, nobody has dr driven or pulled a uh, a U-Haul behind a Hertz. Right, <laughs> that's a ride or downer. No U-Hauls behind the Hertz. No, you can't take it with you, man. Naked we came to this earth. Naked we're going to return to to God, and eternity is a long, long time, mm. and we have a short little vapor of a breath to to get it right. So it's like it's it's a big deal. Like for me. Businesses, I love talking about business, but if 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 we don't get this thing figured out and trust in Jesus, mm. what does it matter? I mean, like Sam Walton, uh, the guy who founded Walmart, um, I wish I could remember what he said on his deathbed. I, I'll have to find it in Evernote here. I, I keep an I keep my like a diary in Evernote. Sure. But he on um you know one of the world's most wealthiest men ever. Um when he there's a there's an article I'll send it to you. You know the guy who wrote uh, Prophet First? Oh sure. Yeah, this is what it is. So Michael McCallowitz, Mike McCallowitz wrote this article, Deathbed Thoughts of a Successful Entrepreneur. Mm. And uh, he talks about Sam Walton of Walmart and when he was an extreme workaholic um, was was never at home hardly at all for his kids and his family and and his, one of his final words on his deathbed was I blew it mm. I blew it and that is tragic yeah that's tragic if anybody wants to find this article if you Google uh, deathbed thoughts of a successful entrepreneur by mm. Mike McCallowitz I found the article on um, boy this was I read this article twelve years ago on on American Express, the credit card company, has a blog, and <laughs> I found for some reason this article. But um, man, I don't want to be Sam Walton. I I don't, I don't. It would be cool to have billions of dollars, but then on your deathbed to be like, oh man, I blew it. Nobody when they're sick, getting open heart surgery, is thinking and praying. Oh man, I wish I would have spent more time at work. I wish I would have um, made more money. I wish I would have uh, started this business or start did that business or may you know been more successful in business or gotten this degree and no they're like does my family know that I love them do I do, do my yeah like do I I don't want to live a life of regrets is what I'm trying to say yes so yes I would rather yeah so yeah that's all I got to say about it. I'll, I'll send you a link to this article if you want. Yeah, please do. 
Uh, Jenny uh, chimed in with an awesome comment. Uh, good for important points to run this type of business. Thank you, Jenny, uh, for chiming in here. So uh, in the time remaining we have here in the show, Joe, I got two questions for you, and I'll tell you what they are. No, yes. three questions, but you got seven minutes to answer. Okay, okay. <laughs> First question, you might want to write these down. First question, I got you covered, is... So you've raised, like myself, you've raised a lot of private money yeah. over the years uh, for your real estate deals. First question, what advice would you give to a brand new real estate investor that's wanting to use private money for their deals? Because you and I know at the end of the day, most real estate deals out there, yes, we do creative stuff. You do lease options. I've bought a ton of subject to, but the majority of deals out there happen with cash, right? I mean, the majority of the deals where it's commercial, single family, new real estate investor wanting to use private money, your advice. My number one advice is learn how to find good deals. Um, and I, you know, there's the argument of whether you should you know, find the money first or find the deals first. I get it. Um, but when you have a good deal, finding the money is easy. I'm telling you, it is super easy when you've got a good deal. So if you're stuck with, if you don't know how to find good deals, what good does it do having a bunch of private money at your disposal, right? So number one is learning how to find good deals. If you're doing houses or you're doing vacant land or commercial or whatever it is, you got to know what a good deal is, number one. And number two, you got to know how to go find it because the rest is easy. There's, there's so much money out there looking for a place to invest. And so when, when, when you learn how to find the deals, well, I'm going to get ahead of myself because I bet you you have another question related to what I was just going to say. But I think no, number one is no, learning how to that's find the, the only deals. Question, that's the only question you're getting on private money. So go ahead. <laughs> well, I was going to say my favorite way to raise private money is it's called the flap your lips method. <laughs> if, if well, now, heard now, of tell that? us exactly. Tell us exactly how the flap your lips method works. Just talk about what you're doing. Right. Like talk about with, with your friends when you're at Starbucks. Somebody always asks you, like, well, what do you do for a living? You know, well, it could be something like, um, well, I, I, I invest people's money into my real estate deals and I give my private investors a safe and consistent eight uh, percent return on their money. What do you do? It could be something like that. Right. It could be I find really good real estate deals. And I, I put my investors' money into my deals, and uh, we make a lot of money together. Um, what do you yeah, do? That's great. And what, you're, and, and what I love about you sharing, Joe, is you're giving actual scripting. Exactly, yeah. actually, actually what to say. Raymond just chimed in. Cool and practical. I'd love to connect to Joe. And Raymond, we're going to tell you how to connect with Joe here in just a moment. But you're giving actual scripting, right? Oh, let me on, give you something better. All right. I got this friend. I got this idea from. I wish I would have done this. I thought of it. Um, he would go to the most nicest, the nicest area of town where all the business people are having breakfast and lunch or whatever, and like a big Starbucks, you know, in a nice area, wherever coffee shops are in the nicer areas, right? Anyway, he would go there and do his business from the coffee shop, and uh, when he would, he'd be on the phone and would talk to people, and he would intentionally talk aloud on the phone about the deals he was working on. Right, say, yeah, man, we're working on this deal. It's great. I've got some private investors um, I, that are that are putting, the, we're pulling our money. We got our money into this deal, and uh, yeah, we bought it for a hundred. We're going to sell it for two hundred thousand. We're, we're, I'm giving my investors eighteen percent on their money or whatever. And he talks about his deals, not making anything up, and talking about his deals uh, and and the and the private investors that he's working with and the, and the money that he's paying them back in interest. And then it, inevitably, every time when he said that when he's done this, uh, he gets people that are leaving the coffee shop and will drop their business card uh, at his table as they're walking by. Say, hey, man, give me a call when you have some time. So I say this, too. It's like it's important to dig your well before you're thirsty, especially when it comes to raising private money. You've got to start talking about it because when you need the money, it's going to be too late. You've got to start talking about what you're doing before you actually need it, because then also psychologically, you're not this in this desperate position where you're begging for money because you'll never get it then. You know, you need to play hard to get. And when somebody's when somebody's asking you what you do, 
you can say, yeah, you know, I've got, I got some money right now. I got some private money. I don't really need anybody. I don't need another investor right now, but I'll be more than happy to add you to my list. So if or when I find another deal, I might be able to let you in on it. And, uh, you know, if, 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 if I feel like we're a good fit, maybe we can do business together. You know what I'm saying? So like, you're not chasing them. You're, you're positioning yourself where they're coming to you and they want, the, you got to think about in terms of getting them to sell you on why you should want to work with them. Absolutely. Does that makes like sense? Talking to a seller, a FISBO. It's not my job to talk them into letting me buy their house. They need to tell me why I should, right? Yeah. Same with a private lender, same with a, a rent to own or lease purchase buyer. Yes. I'm not going to sell them on or try to tell them as to why they ought to buy my house on terms. They need to tell me, well, why should I accept your application for this house? Yeah, yeah. I mean, why should I buy your house and not the 10 others on the street, you know, that are for sale right now? Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know what, Joe, uh, Joe, what you just said was very important. The worst time and most dangerous time and most stressful time to be attracting money for your deals is when you need it for a deal. Exactly. Right. <laughs> I have a perfect advice. One last question, and then we're going to let people uh, know how to connect with you, Joe. And that is you're an expert and you focus a lot of your business on lease options. I mean, you know, there's Tons of different ways to do real estate, right? On and on and on and on and on. Why lease options? Yeah, um, I love lease options. I was going to pull out a book, but I can't get it right now. Anyway, I was doing a lot of houses um, and and doing a lot of wholesaling. And I had bought I had bought some houses with bank financing and some owner financing and subject twos where I took over existing mortgages and whatnot. But I was at this point where um, I I was I was hemorrhaging cash and I needed a way to make bigger chunks of money quicker. So I started wholesaling. And this was back in 2007 and eight. And uh, wholesaling was hard even back then where everybody's complaining about competition. Now it was just, as, it's always been competitive, man. It's like even back in 06, when I first got started, it was competitive. And then even when the market crashed in 2009, and, and and hit bottom in 2012, it was still competitive back then. People always find something to complain about. Either it's too hard to find sellers, it's too hard to find buyers, it's too hard to find money. It's all in your head. So anyway, I was trying to do wholesaling like houses. And I got frustrated with the um, trying to negotiate and beat sellers down on price. You know, I'm trying to buy houses at 50, 60, 70 cents on the dollar. And I just, I, I didn't like doing it. So I thought, well, what if I could give sellers whatever price they wanted if they gave me the terms that I wanted? What if I could give the sellers a the price they want if they let me lease it from them for a period of time and then have the option to buy it in the future? So I started just offering sellers a lease option. I said, hey, listen, what if, I know you want the, you know, the prop property's worth, you know, 200 grand and you want 180. What if I could get you 180, but you lease it to me for a few years first and then I buy it? That wouldn't work for you, would it? And all of a sudden it was like, yeah. Or I could even phrase it like this. What if I could get you, Mr. Seller, I know the house is worth 200, you, you owe 180. What if I could get you the same equity if you would, that you would get if you sold it with a realtor? If you, just had to, if you just waited for it. And let me buy your house with payments over time. Or let me take over your debt. Take over the mortgage, right? And then um, I'll cash you out in three to five years. That wouldn't work for you, would it? So I started just asking sellers different questions. I started giving sellers options. And at the time, I found that it was easier to do lease option deals than regular cash deals at 60 cents on the dollar. So I started doing more lease options. And then when I started flipping lease options, or I call it wholesaling lease options, I started making more money doing that than I was in my full-time job. And I was an engineer um, working on a big power plant. So I quit my job in, in 2009 because I was making more money flipping lease options than I was in my full-time job. And that's when I didn't look back. And uh, so I've done lots of deals. I'm doing a lot of land deals right now as well. I'm flipping vacant land, which is, I, I think is a lot of fun. So as the market changes, this is really important. This is why everybody needs to be a student of the business. Because as the market changes, some things maybe don't work as well as they used to work. And, and maybe, you know, right now, 
this strategy works better than uh, that strategy did a year or two ago. Uh, maybe this part of the country is works better than that part of the country. So markets kind of go through cycles, and it's important to invest in your education. And uh, this is why I love what you do, Jay, is because you're teaching people how to raise private money. Then that works, and that's applicable to all the different strategies that anybody is doing, whether they're buying commercial or land or houses or lease options or cat wholesaling or burr strategy or all the different dozens and dozens of strategies like everybody needs to know how to raise private money does that make sense you got it raymond yeah. says love that input joe and uh chris says just curious uh, what state joe do you live in i live in st louis missouri <laughs> go cardinals <laughs> I love it. Joe, my lands, I knew I was excited to have you on, and now I know why. Well, Joe, thank, thank you, you so much for joining us, and let's let all of our viewers and listeners know exactly how to connect with Joe McCall. Well, listen, I just started two days ago a 30-day Jesus challenge. We were talking about the Lord, so I'm, I'll just end with talking about the Lord. How about that? I love if it. You, if you go to my Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, there's so many of them. I, I have a hard time. I'm not on TikTok. Okay. Uh, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. So that's five. Go to one of those and look me up. Just search for Joe McCall. And I just started a 30-day Jesus challenge where every day for a couple minutes, I talk about what Jesus means to me. Mm -hmm. And it's really been fun. I just share a scripture or tell a little bit of my testimony and just talk about, you know, this is what Jesus means to me. And I put a verse in there and I tell people, hey, if you want me to pray for you, if you want other people to pray for you, like type something in the comments or DM me and I'd be, I'd be more than happy to pray for you. So I just started doing that. If you go look me up on the socials there, um, you can kind of follow me there. I do have um, a podcast. If anybody wants to know, I've been doing this podcast for 12 years. I don't know. I've got 11 or 1200 episodes. Um, it's called the Real Estate Investing Mastery Podcast. You can see it on my logo behind me here. The Real Estate Investing Mastery Podcast. So wherever you listen to podcasts on um, Spotify, Apple, um, even Amazon Music, or it, you know all of them, you can just search for Joe McCall, Real Estate Investing Mastery, and you will see my podcasts there. Or you can go to my website, realestateinvestingmastery.com. Um, you can also go to joemccall.com. And I got awesome. a bunch of stuff there. Awesome. Joe, thank you so much for coming on and, sh and sharing, no pun intended, sharing your heart. Thank you. <laughs> you want to see my uh, scar? Uh, uh, there no. you go. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm <laughs> I got a giant scar. It's like six inches. Shoo, mercy. I bet you do. Well, I'm so glad that you're recovering as you are. As I said, you look fantastic. You sound great. And um, I'm looking forward to joining you on your podcast in a few yes. days. <laughs> I think it's tomorrow or Thursday. Yeah, yeah something like that. It's too. on the calendar. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Joe, awesome. very much. Thank you so much, Joe. There you have it, my friends. Another amazing, and I mean truly amazing, episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor. You just heard my dear friend, Joe McCall. I mean, here on this podcast, we are all about serving you. So if you would like to give back, and this podcast meant something to you, share it with a friend. In addition to that, be sure and subscribe, follow. If you happen to be watching on YouTube, be sure and subscribe and ring that bell so you don't miss out on any of the upcoming future episodes. If you're watching on iTunes, Spotify, etc., be sure and follow me. I'm Jay Connor, wishing you all the best. Here's to taking your business and your personal self to the next level. I'll see you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jayconner.com slash money guide. That's j-c-o-n-n-e-r.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jayconnor.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. <laughs>